Um, tonight we're going to focus about a Japanese man's testimony. And this Japanese man was, y'all ever heard the movie uh, Torah, Torah, Torah? This Japanese guy is the one that said that. It meant tiger, tiger, tiger. And that was the cry that meant that that, that kamikaze mission on Pearl Harbor was a success. This man that said that wound up becoming a Christian. And that's what we want to talk about tonight. So often Pearl Harbor is is just about the the death of the American soldiers or the you know the the attack on the base itself of uh, the destruction. If you ever watch that movie Pearl Harbor, it's you know it's it's awful to think about all of that and, and how it happened. Um this guy's name was Mitsuo Fuchida. Now Fuchida grew up a lover of all things Japan, a lover of his nation. And in the early 1900s, he had grown to hate the United States because of the way that particularly Japanese Americans were treated um, over here. Because a lot of them were, were brought over here and encamped. And if you ever look back on it, it, it wasn't pleasant. Um, I could see why somebody from Japan would develop a hatred for the U.S. back then. So this man was was just, <clears throat> couldn't stand America. I mean, like, join the club, right? So he goes and he joins the, um, the Japan Naval Air Force, and by 1941, this man had over 10,000 hours, flight hours, and says he established himself as Japan's top pilot. And when the military leaders needed somebody to command a surprise attack on this military base that the U.S. had established out in the middle of the ocean, Pearl Harbor, this was the man for the job. He was the one that cried out, Torah, 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 indicating that they had completed their mission. He was also surprised that of the 70 flight officers that attacked Pearl Harbor that day, when they got back home, he was the only one that survived. All the rest of them died. Which I wonder, how do you do a kamikaze attack and live, right? That's called a failure, or is it? I don't know. He successfully lived through the kamikaze. Anyway. He had another close call. There was the Battle of Midway took place in 1942. And he got shot down in that battle and survived that also. This man then went through two um, flight attacks and survived them both. In 1945... By 1945, he had gained the position of the Imperial Navy's Air Operations Officer. He was in charge of basically the Air Force. And on August 6th, he was eating breakfast in uh, Nara, Japan. When he got word that a bomb had been dropped by the Americans on Hiroshima, or Hiroshima, however you want to say it. So he went to investigate so that he could send word back to the Imperial Palace. And when he got there, what he saw changed him. It shook him to the core at the loss of life in an instant. Shook him up. It was a Buddhist man who was so mad at the United States, and then after seeing this, it went beyond anger or, or hate. It, it just... Sometimes you see stuff and it changes the fabric of a man. That same day, August the 6th, when the bomb was dropped on Hiroshima, there was an American POW named Jacob Shazer. He prayed for peace that day. He was one of uh, the ones that was part of Doolittle's Raiders in the Pacific War, or the Pacific Theater, and he was dropping bombs near Tokyo and he had to parachute 
out because the plane was hurt, and he landed in the Japanese-controlled part of China. He was at a POW camp. And you can imagine what a Japanese-run POW camp was like in World War II. While he was in prison, he was first in Nanjing and then later in Beijing, the Shazer found Jesus. He became a Christian man. It says he found his heart all of a sudden being softened towards those Japanese uh, oppressors. He started thinking about them and, and he started seeing them. And this is what got me. He started seeing their souls. And that's something that I prayed God for years ago, especially about lost people or people that were off-putting, people that you may not like. God help me see their soul. And if you can look at somebody's soul, you can pray for them because of the lostness. If there's anything good about you, you can pray for somebody's soul if it's lost, right? I mean, you, you would not want nobody to go to hell, ever. Ever. You want somebody to get saved. This guy, DeSazer, after he had, was liberated, he wrote, I was a prisoner of the Japanese. And that was uh, an article that was in almost every newspaper, magazine. And he, he detailed his story. And there's, I think there's been movies made about it. In 1950, DeSazer was in Japan he went back to Japan in 1948 as a missionary. Okay, He was evangelizing the place that he had bombed. All right, He had such a heart for the Japanese people. He had went and did a 40-day fast and prayed for revival to break out in Japan. It says in the article that I read, the Shazer was planting churches throughout Japan, and Fuchida heard about this man and wanted to meet him. When they met, Fuchida was so moved by the testimony of this Christian that he went and he bought a Bible. He read that Bible in his native tongue, Japanese. He read that Bible and he gave his heart to Christ. Fuchida did. He survived Pearl Harbor as a kamikaze pilot. He survived uh, the, the Battle of Midway and being shot down. And here was this Japanese man, ain't no telling how many souls he sent to meet their maker, and he was getting saved. It said Fuchida became an evangelist. He went around in his native land of Japan spreading a message of peace and forgiveness and establishing churches. Do you know who got to baptize Fushida? That soldier did. The Roses. The one that, uh, the Shazer, I'm sorry. The one that uh, basically led him to the Lord. They fought on opposite sides of the war. They were fighting for different reasons. They were fighting out of different places of passion. They're going to live together forever. You know, it kind of, on days like today and 9-11, and it kind of puts into perspective, you know, agile relationship with one another and that ideologies and, and different difference of opinion, difference of religion, all of these things can cause mankind to do some pretty awful things. That sneak attack on Pearl Harbor, the, the cowardly sneak attack on, on the Twin Towers and, and the Pentagon. It takes cowards to sneak up on somebody, don't it? It takes brave man to, to look straight ahead and realize and admit his mistake. It takes a man to be able to stand up and admit the mistake. Or a lady. Okay? Take somebody with courage. Somebody that is like, I'm not concerned about winning the war. I 
not worried about being right. Love is going to win. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15, it says this. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Paul said, of whom I am the worst. He said, he is the chief of sinners. There is none worse. Do you think Fushida felt that way? I can imagine he did. I can imagine DeShazer felt that way. You could probably poll anybody that come out of World War II that was on, uh, you know, in any theater war. And they probably felt like the chief of sinners. Carrying out orders, you know. Because they had to do some pretty awful things. Verse 16 says, But for that very reason, I was shown mercy, so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display His unlimited patience as an example for those who would believe on Him and receive eternal life. So, what Paul is saying, and Paul said it in other places too, especially when he was talking about grace. How do you get to see grace? It's when people sin and they are forgiven of that sin, that's when you see grace. You're not going to see grace without God shedding His grace on people and forgiving people of their sins and taking them and picking them back up and setting them up straight again. You're never going to see grace just by happenstance. Paul said, so what then? Should we go on sinning more so that we can see more grace? Love is greater. Paul says right here, why? Why was my life the way it was? Think back to the time before you were a Christian, before you were a believer, before you surrendered to the authority of God. Okay? Before that time when you became a Christian, your life was different, right? Maybe your your judgments or, or your selfishness or your sin. There's so many different things that were different back then. God let you go through some stuff to show you the power of grace, to show you the extent of mercy, to show you the depth of His love. And He did it so that Christ Jesus might display His patience for sin. He's waited on us. And you got saved, right? But what about the people that ain't saved yet? When is the last time you prayed for a lost soul that God would wait? That God would be patient with that person? That God would have mercy for that lost soul? That God would help you to see their soul? Pray for them. This man, DeShazer, he went to Japan and he fasted for 40 days. He took water and vitamins and did not ingest any food for 40 days. You know how much weight you're going to lose? Y'all, that's a, that's a better diet than mono. Yeah. I'm just, I'm just, that is dedication. That is anguish. That's, that's powerful. The testimony of of these men, I think it we'll let it remind us of three things since we're Baptists. Okay. First thing, when we look at the testimony of a changed soul, first thing it should remind us is that we serve a powerful and a faithful God. Amen? We serve a faithful and a powerful God. You see somebody that's been changed by God, that is evidence that we serve a faithful because God did not leave them, God didn't give up on them, God waited on them, right? Right. God is patient. He is long-suffering. He will wait. I 
I'm still blown away that God waited. Or God kept me alive long enough to get saved. You know, think about how many times you could have been dead before you got your heart right. You could have gone to hell. But God was patient. He was long-suffering. This man flew into Pearl Harbor to, to crash his plane. <laughs> and he lived. Got shot down in another battle and lived. It wasn't his destiny to die in war. It was his destiny to make it through and gain a testimony. Can you imagine how many Christians are in Japan today because that one guy, everybody had to know him. He had to be some kind of like war hero or very popular individual for having survived Pearl Harbor. And now he's talking about we need to forgive. We need to love. Don't ever think that somebody is so bad or somebody is, is not able to be saved. Don't ever think that somebody is, is out of the reach of our sovereign, all-powerful God. Because if He could reach you, He could reach anybody, right? Another thing is about when this man bought a Bible and read it. Second thing that, that this testimony of a saved man reminds us is that God's Word has the power to change. There is nothing in this world, on this planet, that you could ever learn that would be more valuable or greater than God's Word. Memorize it. Store it up. And what does it do? It comes to mind exactly when you need it. And it nurtures, it teaches, it guides, it gives you peace. It, it just makes so much more sense. Once you read it, the Bible says faith comes from hearing and hearing from the Word of God. That's how people know who it is that's calling them to salvation. We are talking about it Sunday, Sunday night, I believe it was, about how like, at any point in, in, in the world, any point in the world, there's been over 95% of the population believe that there's something, some higher power. At any point in the history, His Word has never changed. What does the last verse say? Don't add nothing to it. Don't take nothing away from it. And it's maintained. It stays. And it's still true. It is still changing people's lives. And if you read it, it's going to change you. It's going to challenge you. It's going to, it's going to make you feel bad sometimes. And it's also going to encourage you. And it's going to give you some hope because here's a trustworthy saying, Jesus came in the world to save sinners. That's good news, isn't it? Do you know somebody lost? Wouldn't it be great if they got a testimony? There's probably some folks that didn't think you would get saved, right? I mean, I know it. there's probably some folks that, that didn't think that there was any hope. I'm sure some of us in here probably feels like at one point in our life we were the chief of sinners. Like, how could God possibly clean me off and restore me? How, how could restoration happen? Well, our main business as a church and as individual believers is to take the Word of God and to unleash it onto the world. That's called evangelizing. And that's what we are taught to do. That's what we are told to do in, in Acts 1.8 and in the book of Matthew with the Great Commission. We are told to go. And what do we do? Once we go, we don't just go and be like, hey, how's it going? <laughs> hey, how you doing? No, it's taking the Word because that is what changes people's lives. So casseroles are great. Hams are, you know, hams are hams. But the Word is what can really change folks, all right? You take somebody sweet potato pie, what are they going to do? They're going to thank you, they're going to love you, and they're going to get fat with diabetes and go to hell. But you could take them to the Word of God and they could get fat on the Spirit and live forever. So what's better? Sweet potato pie, eternal life. Y'all's lack of hollering that answer out is kind of concerning. 
Um, third thing, third point I want to talk about. Testimony of a saved person. only comes about because of somebody praying for that soul. Anything that happens on this planet starts with prayer. Somebody prayed for you. Somebody prayed for you. Somebody prayed for your safety, your soul, your your, uh, independence from sin. Who prayed for you before you came to know Jesus. Who are you praying for? I know the people that that it I know the people that prayed for me to get saved. I know them because you know they were the ones that took me to church. They picked me up and took me to church. They were the ones that put up with my smart mouth on the church van and in the Sunday school class, and still loved on me and showed me, wait a minute, this ain't like regular public school right here. They ain't sending me out in the hall to paddle me. They don't even want to hit on me. They love me and stuff. What is this about? I have no doubt that they prayed for me. Cat Forbes, Gladys Hayes, Taunt Phillips, these are some folks that prayed for me. Nova Dugard, She prayed for me. I know these people. And there are times, not every day, but there are times when I get to thinking about my salvation and who brought that about. I say, God, you tell them, hey, thank you for them. They made an impact. Oh, that we could make an impact like that. That one day when we're dead and gone, somebody remembers that you prayed for them. You know? What what kind of legacy is that? What's that look like? It's just sharing, isn't it? Showing somebody that you care about their soul. I mean, that's that kind of stuff that when we're dead and gone, people will remember that. Who are you praying for today? You know, you might have been praying for them for a long time. Somebody you know that needs salvation. Pray for them. Last week we had several different Topics and several folks prayed out loud and, and, and stuff like that. Well, tonight, let's pray for the lost. Thank God that you were able to get saved. Thank God for the person or people that led you to the Lord and prayed for you. Thank God for them. Pray for somebody lost. Testimony of these two guys, these two soldiers going through the horrors of war and on the other side of it becoming friends and testifying about the greatness of God. We could all be so lucky to have a story like that. One that inspires people and makes them want to be better. Wouldn't that be awesome? What's your story going to be? What's your church going to be? If you got everybody up that you led to the Lord, what would your church look like? You know? I mean, not like right at this moment. I mean like once after we're all dead. Okay? So we're 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 in the new heaven, we're on the new earth, and we're we've got our eternal neighbors. Who's living around you? I'm moving away. So y'all wanna Hang out. <laughs> Do you get to change neighborhood? I mean, I don't know if you you're not you're not sinful, so you do, you don't get tired of each other, right? I wouldn't guess you would. In the, on the new earth, not now, but but I mean, 